I don't know. Okay, so let's go back to the limit section, which was number seven. Let's go back to the limit section, number seven. And I want to talk about problems uh, P, Q, and R. P, Q, and R. You might recognize those, I hope, because the easiest way to do P, Q, and R is to recognize the formula, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Can anybody tell me what is the limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, the same as? This is the derivative. <coughs> so you should never do P, Q, and R using a limit. We should convert it instead to its function, and then we should evaluate the limit. So if we look at P, let me give you the example. The function there is the tangent. The value that we are evaluating the first derivative at is pi over 3. So if I looked at P, I would never, ever try to calculate that limit. But what I would do is I would say, oh, the function I see is a tangent. I know the derivative of that. The derivative of a tangent is secant squared. And then I just get to plug in pi over 3. Okay, now let's talk about the secant of pi over 3. Pi over 3 is 60 degrees. The cosine at 60 degrees is um, 1 half. So this is really the reciprocal of 1 half or 2 squared. The answer is 4. That's P. Yes. Let's look at R. What's our function? What's our function in the problem? Cosine. What point are we evaluating it at? H. When you don't, or I'm sorry, uh, X. When you don't see anything here, see, let's look at the difference between P and R. P, the X, see where the X is? was pi over 3. Here, it's just going to be an x. So we don't have to do anything more than find the derivative. So the answer to r is the derivative of the cosine. What is the derivative of a cosine? Negative sine. So it is your job to recognize the fact that that is the same as the derivative of the function that is sitting there. Find the derivative of the function that is sitting there. And if there is a point here, that's what you plug into the derivative. If there's an x there, you just leave it an x. That's as simple as those ones are. It is your job to memorize that formula and make sure you know that the derivative's uh, definition is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. There you go. Okay. Uh, limits. Let's keep going and look at some more limits before we move on from limits. I just got to make sure if there's any other limits on there. Okay. So, uh, other limits I want to talk about. Um, if you have a limit to infinity, remember that is just the vertical asymptote or ends. What happens when the highest power is in our denominator? What is always our vertical asymptote? So for J, what is the uh, vertical asymptote or the ends heading toward if our highest power is in our denominator for a rational function? It's always heading to zero, so the answer to this one is zero.
You should always try direct substitution unless you see infinities. If you're heading toward infinities, you need to know that that is end behavior. If you're heading toward a number, that's not end behavior. But if you're heading to negative or positive infinity, that is going to be end behavior. Okay? So that's pretty much um, a lot of what I see about limits. Now let's just practice some more derivatives before we do some integration practice. So now if we could go to number 12. It says find y prime when x is 2 if y is equal to 7 times the square root of, or 7 divided by the square root of x to the fourth minus 15. Don't forget for derivatives and integrals, any type of rewrite should happen that will make it easier for you to do this process. So I would rewrite this as 7 times x to the fourth minus 15 to the negative 1 half power. So that's the first thing I would do to this problem before I actually took the derivative. Now taking the derivative shouldn't be that much of an issue. Uh, y prime is uh, drop the negative 1 half in front times the 7 since it was already there. That's negative 7 halves. Stuff stays there. Power goes down by 1. Multiply by the derivative of the stuff. That's a chain rule. That should not have been rocket science. You should, you've been doing derivatives for a long time. But because we have been doing integration, it's really easy to forget the process. So go back over and look at your rules of derivatives, OK? So they asked us to plug in 2. I would not do any simplification because when I have a number to plug in, I don't do any simplification. 2 to the 4th is 16. 16 minus 15 is 1. So that's 1 to any power, which is just 1. 2 to the 3rd is 8. 8 times 4 is 32. 32 divided by 2 is 16. That's technically negative 7 times 16. I will allow you to do that last part. Uh, we don't need to, but yeah. Okay. So that is that. Problem. Anybody have any questions about number 12? Yep. So there is number 12. Number 13 is a very similar process. I would do a rewrite first, make this 2x plus 17 to the 2 thirds. Remember, your power is your numerator, your denominator is your index, or whatever is in that little cube root square root symbol. And then I'm going to do the derivative. 2 thirds drops down in front. Stuff stays there. Power goes down by 1. Don't forget to multiply by the derivative of the inside. OK, let me say that again. If there's a constant out in front. It just hangs along for the ride. Power drops down in front. Stuff stays there. Power goes down by 1. Multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now they ask us to evaluate this at 5. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 plus 17 is 27. Now let's evaluate what 27 to the negative 1 third is. A 1 third power is just taking the cube root. 27, the cube root of 27 is 3. But that negative exponent makes it its reciprocal. So this is really 2 thirds times 1 third times 2 over 1. Your final answer would be 4 over 9. OK? Do we have any questions about number 13? Yes. Yeah, that's where that's 27 to the negative one third. Is that that's where that piece came from? That one third. Yep. Okay. Let's to look at 14. That is an easy rewrite, but this rewrite is really important. Expect one like this on the test. 
I would rewrite that as 8 thirds X. I would pull out the 3 eighths and I would write the X as a negative 1 power. So expect one like that. It then becomes a very easy problem. The derivative of 8 thirds X is just 8 thirds. The derivative of negative 3 eighths X to the negative 1 the negative drops down in front, multiplies by what's already there. That's why it becomes a positive 3 eighths. The x goes down by 1. Now, we are plugging in 1 for the x values. Plugging in 1 is great because 1 to any power is going to just be 1. So it ends up being 8 thirds plus 3 eighths. Now, the common denominator for those is 24. So this is 64 over 24 plus 9 over 24, which is 73 over 24. Okay, so expect our derivatives of any of the rules that we have done before. We're going to keep going with this. Uh, page because we have to do a mixture of the things I see here. Okay, let's. Do we have any questions there? Are we good? Okay, now let's go to 15. I'm going to do a little rewrite. Not much I can do as far as a rewrite goes. But I would make the square root to a one-half power. I would put a physical dot between them to remind me that I must do the product rule. Now let's go over what those rules are. The product rule is the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. The quotient rule is bottom times the derivative of the top minus top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Those rules are not going to go anywhere. You missed me saying that to you, didn't you? <laughs> Let's do y prime for this one. Okay, so it's first, leave it alone, times the derivative of the second. That's a chain rule. So we're going to drop the one half, leave the stuff, power goes down by one, times the derivative of the inside, plus the second piece, leave it alone, just rewrite it, times the derivative of the first piece, which is just a quantity, the quantity of 2 minus x, that derivative is negative 1. Now, they asked us to find the first derivative when x is equal to 1, so we need to put a 1 back for all the x's. So I'm just going to kind of simplify each piece as I go, okay? So 2 minus 1 is 1 times a half. 1 plus 8 is 9 to the negative 1 half. 2 times 1 is 2. This is going to be 9 again to the positive 1 half times negative 1. Now, if it's 9 to a 1 half power, that's indicating a square root. So this piece right here, that's just the square root of 9 or 3. This piece here has a negative one-half, so the negative is going to square root it and flip it. So this is one-third. Okay? So the twos cancel, and the first piece, one isn't really doing anything. So this is really one-third minus three, or one-third minus nine-thirds is negative eight. So that is number 15. There is number 15. <laughs> okay, we're going to keep going. Uh, we're going to skip the uh, 16, 17, 18, we will come back, but let's talk about, okay, so we've done that one, 
We've done those ones. Okay. So now um, let's um, let's do number twenty four. Now, they have actually written the notation the way that I would write it with that three on the outside to indicate that we are going to use a chain rule. Sometimes the cosine will have the little three next to it. Rewrite it like you see here to make sure you know it is that whole cosine function to the third power. So our derivative, we're going to drop the three down. The stuff is going to stay there. The power is going to go down by 1. But now we have to take the derivative of the stuff inside. We still have a chain rule because the cosine has junk stuff inside of it. So it is the negative sign of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So that's as far as we get as far as the derivative for 24. Now they ask us to plug in pi over 6. Pi over 6 is 30 times 2 is um, 60 minus 180 is negative 120. So this is really going to say 3 times the cosine of negative 120 squared times negative 2 times the sine of negative 120 times 2. Now, negative 120 lands us at the 240 spot. So you can think of it as 240. The point at 240 um, the point on the unit circle at 240 it's uh, the third quadrant it is uh, negative one half negative square root of three over two. So that's what we have to use for this problem. So the cosine value is going to be the negative one half. When we square it, we're going to get one fourth. So this is three times one fourth times negative two times negative square root of three over two times two. So I've just taken out and I got that big old list. Um, negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. So we can cancel that out and just leave a negative 1 behind. Don't forget the negative. But there's a negative over there. That's going to be a positive. Okay, that's good. So we really get um, 3 radical 3 over 2, I believe, is our final answer. So that did require quite a bit of junk to get that accomplished. Yeah. The derivative of the inside, because this has a derivative of 2, it requires us to do the chain rule one more time. So, so let's go over that derivative again. The 3 drop down in front. The stuff stayed there, power goes down by 1. The derivative of this, if I said, hey, what is the cosine of uh, 2x minus pi's derivative? It would be the negative sign of the stuff times the derivative of the I stuff. Was about the top part where it's like the negative 2 sign and then multiplying by 2. Oh, because I'm a dork. That should not be a 2. That should not be a 2. So how does that, does that make it a 4 down at the bottom? Thank you. I just was writing twos all over the place, wasn't I? Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that is that one. So now I would like to um, jump to some implicit differentiation. So uh, the next thing we're going to do The next thing, we're, we're going to do 27 next. We'll do 27 next. Everybody got that now?
We're good with 24. Okay. Next one I want to do is 27. Okay. To do 27, remember when the X's and Y's are all jumbled up, if we are doing uh, the derivative, this is the one where we have to use implicit differentiation, and every time we take a derivative of a Y, you tack on the Y prime. Remember that? So I would also suggest for this little piece right here, put a little dot to indicate that you do have to use the product rule or that problem will not be correct. Okay, okay so we're going to take the derivative in terms of X, so that's why Y gets a Y prime. And then you just get to plug in 1, 1, which is great because that makes that part nice. Okay, so up above, I'm going to do it right above it. Um, so you do 4y cubed times y prime, 4x cubed, x doesn't need anything because we're differentiating with respect to x. Now we're going to do the product rule, so we're going to write the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. <coughs> And then the derivative of 9x is just 9. The derivative of 9 is 0. So that's our derivative. I would not simplify it when you have numbers to plug in. So we get to plug in the number uh, 1, 1. So every place we see an x or a y, we replace it with 1. So that would be 4y prime plus 4 minus 2y prime minus 4 plus 9 equals 0. Look how simple it just made it by instantly plugging in those numbers. Now, I don't have a lot of room, but I'm going to kind of go to the right here. If you add up the y primes, you get 2y primes. If you add up the numbers, 4 minus 4 plus 9 is 9. Subtract 9 from both sides. Divide by negative 2. And that is y prime at the point 1, 1. So that is implicit differentiation. Now, doing that problem, we're going to go back to a problem before that it, uh, we have to do the same exact thing. But they ask the question a lot differently, okay? So any questions about 27? Okay, everybody, now let's scroll backwards. And I want to look at 18, and I want to look at the difference about how they asked the question. For 18, they say, find the slope of the tangent line to the graph x squared plus 2xy squared plus 3y equals 31 at the point 2, negative 3. To find the slope of the tangent, we have to remember that the slope of the tangent is just y prime or the first derivative, whichever applies to that particular problem. So you have to do the first derivative. But they're all mixed up. So it's implicit differentiation. So technically, it's exactly like the other problem. OK, so now let's take that into consideration. We're going to put a dot between those two. Every place we see a derivative of a y, you tack on a y prime. Otherwise, it just acts like any other derivative. OK, so it's going to be 2x plus the first, so that's my first, first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay, let me say that again. So my first is 2x, my second is y squared. So this is first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay, then I'm not done. The derivative of 3y is a uh, 3y prime. The derivative of 31 is nothing. Now, I am finding the slope of the tangent, y prime, at the point 2, negative 3. So every place I see x, I'm going to put a 2. Every place I see y, I'm going to put a negative 3. They weren't as nice as far as we got to plug in some numbers. Ugh. OK, so 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. 
And if I do something weird, please stop me. Um, y squared is 9 times 2 is 18. 3 times y prime is just 3y prime. I don't know. Uh, 4 times negative 6 is the only thing I see immediately is let's make that a negative 24. Now, this just is an equation we got to solve. So let's put our like terms together. Uh, 4 plus 18 is 22. Tw negative 24 plus 3 is negative 21. Um, let's get the y primes to one side and the non-y primes to the other. And then we find our slope of our tangent is 22 divided by 21. So whether they say find y prime at a point or they say find the slope of the tangent at a point, they're asking you to do the exact same procedure. Okay, makes sense so far? Hopefully this is uh, reminding you of how this stuff works a little bit. Okay, let me kind of look here. Now I'm just peeking what I, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is number 28. We're going to do 28, maybe 29, but let's start with 28. On the test, I am going to give you the first and the second derivative of a function. And I'm going to ask you, where is the function increasing, decreasing? Where does it have a local mins and maxes? Where is the function uh, concave up, concave down? Do you remember all that stuff? OK, let me remind you of the rules. Let me just add a page in here. OK. So what the first derivative tells us the first derivative tells us the following. It tells us um, where it, the first derivative um, is positive, it is increasing. Where the first derivative is negative, it is decreasing. Where the first derivative equals zero or is undefined but exists in the original Um, those are critical numbers, and that is where our maxes and mins can live. Remember, if there's a section where it's increasing then decreasing, that is a local max. If it's decreasing then increasing, it is a local min. The second derivative, where the second derivative is greater than zero or positive, it is concave up. Our cup is up. If our second derivative is negative, it is concave down. A change in concavity is an inflection point. So if we find where the second derivative equals zero, and we see that it changes concavity at that spot, that means that it is an inflection point at that spot. Now, it has to be a point on the graph. It can't be an undefined value. It would have to be a point on the graph. So those are some rules to think about. Um, and uh, then let's go back and apply some of those rules. And that's what we'll focus on for the rest of class today. Okay, so now let's go back to 
uh, 28. So 28 says, we know a function's first and second derivative determine on which the function is increasing. If we want to know where a function is increasing, we do not give a hoot about the second derivative. It doesn't tell us that darn thing. What we're focusing on is that. And what we want to do is we want to make a plus minus chart. So the first thing we want to do is if it is not in factored form, get it in factored form. After it's in factored form, we want to set each factor equal to zero. And you want to solve each piece, piece and find those critical numbers. So we have a critical number at zero and a critical number at three-fourths. So we have two critical numbers here, uh, zero and three-fourths. So we're going to take and we're going to put them on a number line, least to greatest order, just a number line order. Those are points that exist, so we are going to put little dots there. Then we're going to turn this into a number line. On the side, we have to list all factors and any powers that are involved, so x squared and 4x minus 3. Now this is a number line, it's representing a number line. We are going to plug in some points along the number line that's in the region we're talking about. So negative one, uh, maybe a half is in between zero and three-fourths. And after three-fourths, why not positive one? Now if I plug negative one but I square it, I get a positive. If I plug one half and I square it, I get a positive. If I plug in one and square it, I get a positive. So that row is positive. Now let's plug in to 4x minus 3. If I plug in negative 1, I get negative 7, so that's a negative. If I plug in 1 half, I get negative 1, that's a negative. If I plug in 1, that is um, a positive 1, so that's a positive. Now these things are multiplied together, so let's multiply them together. A positive times a negative is a negative. A positive times a negative is a negative. A positive times a positive is a positive. So this function is decreasing from negative infinity. You could say from negative infinity to zero and then zero to three-fourths, but those are all points that are included. So we would say from negative infinity up to three-fourths, it is decreasing. It is increasing on the interval from three-fourths to infinity. Now increasing and decreasing do not, um, they do not, care about the end three-fourths because that's the switchover point. Technically, this is decreasing and decreasing. I would assume that that's an inflection point. This one, it is decreasing and then increasing. So that is a local minimum if they ask. That's a local minimum. That's probably going to be an inflection point. You'd have to look at the second derivative to tell you that. Okay. So in 29, what part do we care about? If it says find the where the function is decreasing, what do we care about? The first derivative. Who cares about the second derivative? We don't even need to use it. Now, um, here if it's a fractional function, the only, only difference, we still make sure it's in factored form, which it is. Set the top equal to zero. Set the bottom equal to zero. Solve each one but I would put a little slash through the one that came from the bottom. It has to have an open circle on our chart. And that's more important when it comes to critical numbers or, you know, okay. Does that, is that a point that works in the original, you know, that sort of thing. So if you put those in least to greatest order, our negative three halves comes first, our one comes second. Negative three halves came from our bottom, so it's open. One came from the top, so it's uh, closed. We're going to put both of them over here, and it becomes now from now on kind of a problem like before. We need test values. Before negative three halves is negative two. Zero's in here, so I like to plug in zero. And then let's go two. Now we're plugging it into the first derivative. 
or in, into the factors from the first derivative. So if I plug in negative 2, let's go across the top for x minus 1. If I plug in negative 2, I get negative 3. If I plug in 0, I get negative 1. If I plug in 2, I get positive 1. Now let's do it for the bottom factor, 2x plus 3. If I plug in negative 2, I get negative 1. If I plug in 0, I get a positive. If I plug in 2, I get a positive. Now those things are dividing, so it works the same way whether they were multiplied. Two negatives make a positive. One negative is a negative. Two positives make a positive. Now they want a decreasing. So the decreasing stuff is from negative 3 halves to 1. It is increasing in two sections, from negative infinity to negative 3 halves, and also from 1 to infinity. If we were to look, most likely that's a vertical asymptote in our graph, but we would have to look what the original format of the original function was. This one here, uh, we are going down and then up. That would be a local minimum. Okay? So that is a little bit about using our first derivative. So we're going to stop here. Please turn in uh, what we have done together. Some of you did it yesterday but did not turn it in to me. Please turn in what we did yesterday. Turn in what we do today. Every day this week you're going to turn in what we have done.